The ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. everyone, thank you for joining us today for the ANA eLearning Academy. The ANA would like to thank our partner Graysheet for their support of our eLearning program. Today we have Abby, who will be presenting on a brief overview of Hobo Nichols. You will be muted for this presentation, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A and I will read them to Abby at the end of her presentation. And without further ado, here's Abby. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for taking time out of your day to come to my presentation. I know it's kind of a weird time block in like the middle of the afternoon, so I appreciate everyone coming out. It's been a while since I did one of these, so I'm very excited to be getting back in there and doing some numismatic presentations and stuff. Uh, so like Logan said, I'm doing a brief overview of Hobo Nichols today. Um, I kind of sat down and compiled a list of the top questions I get when I bring up the fact that I'm a hobo nickel carver or mention carving to um, other people, fellow numismatists included, because a lot of people don't know what it is. So I will be answering kind of my main three questions that I get, which is what are hobo nickels? Kind of what do they look like? What's the history behind them? Why are they something that exists? Um, I will be discussing the tools used uh, back during the Great Depression and now in modern times. And then I will be explaining to y'all why this is a perfectly legal art form for us to be doing, because a lot of people think that it's illegal because they think that we are uh, destroying coins from the US Mint. So a little bit about me. So. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met or who don't know much about me, so I'm not just like this random girl talking to you about a random aspect of numismatics. Um, I've been collecting coins for 10 years now, I think it is. So just about half of my life, which is pretty crazy. Um, I've been very heavily involved in numismatics ever since I got started. I've done multiple exhibits. Um, written lots of articles, different things like that. Um, and I was named YN of the Year back in 2018. Um, unfortunately, lately, numismatics have kind of taken a back burner just because college is taking up a lot more of my time than I anticipated and was hoping it would. But this summer I'm taking off and I'm hoping to kind of get back in there, do a lot more of stuff like this. I started hobo nickel carving six or seven years ago, I think around the time I was 13. My mentor, the late Archie Taylor, kind of got my attention at a fun show one year and uh, noticed that I was interested in the carving because I've always been loved the art behind all coins. And so he, the fact that people were changing the design on a coin was really cool to me. So he called me over and let me sit down and carve a coin myself. I did nothing but lines. I just kind of scratched a couple of lines into the surface. I think I ended up cutting myself too. I was kind of a disaster, but he saw something in me and told me to come out to a local show the following month. And so I did, and he sat me down, he put a power tool in my hand and he was like, carve a coin. So that's what I did. I sat there for three hours and I carved probably the worst hobonickel you've ever seen. It's like these super deep lines. I carved off the eye was you know a mess but as soon as I did that I was like this is something that I definitely want to do and I've been involved doing it ever since I've you know uh, learned from lots of different carvers I go to lots of different coin shows and set up and carve and sell at shows and I'm very passionate about sharing the story of the hobo nickel with others um, and other numismatists because a lot of numismatists have never heard of this it's not just people who don't collect coins who don't know what this is so that's a little bit about me. <laughs> so let's get right into it. So what is a hobo nickel? Hobo nickel carving is an art form that has been around since before the Great Depression, but it really started picking up during the Great Depression. As the name suggests, <laughs> um, these coins were carved by hobos, by people who were out of work, didn't have a place to stay, were kind of roaming from place to place, looking for work, looking for things to do. And it's basically just you change the design on a coin. <clears throat> so you take a buffalo nickel, and this, for those of you who don't know, is the obverse of a buffalo nickel. So the reverse of this coin is going to be the buffalo. And you change it to look a little bit more like this. 
So uh, classic hobo nickel designs, we pretty much just take away the feathers, the braid, and the hair of the Indian and add on a hat, a shirt and collar, an ear, some different hair, possibly a beard and a mustache, but some people don't. It depends on your preference or the design that you are doing at that moment. These are classic or traditional hobo designs. These are ones that were ones that were typically done during the Great Depression by those original carvers. These are the designs that they were doing. And a lot of modern carvers um, model their designs after those. I personally really enjoy doing classic carvings because I love the history that's rooted in this art form and that's rooted in this craft. And for me, this is a way to help honor that. And I like the way they look. So <laughs> I like doing those. Um, obviously, we have modernized it a little bit. You know, we may do different hats. You know, I do some baseball caps or things like that. But a lot of my designs do stay with the traditional add a hat, add a shirt, add a beard sort of feel. So those are the traditional or the classic hobo nickels. But there are a lot of carvers who do modern designs. So some people will change the Indian or enhance the Indian, I should say. Um, and that one is very, very popular among a lot of modern carvers that I know. I really enjoy doing these. As you can see, I don't take away anything from the Indian. I just add on things. So instead of just keeping the two feathers, I added three more. I added a headband, some more paint, and then I enhanced the hair with, you know, carving and all those different hairlines. These are very, very popular. A lot of people enjoy doing those. But a lot of what you will see now as well with modern carvers is modern designs. So different Disney characters or superheroes or just, you know, things like that. A lot of my coins recently, I've been working on a stock uh, for the upcoming fun show in July. And I would say about 90% of those I've been carving, I've carved masks on. So obviously those are kind of <laughs> to remember last year and this year and kind of everything that we've all been going through. So I do those and that's, you know, one of my modern designs. This is an Iron Man coin that I designed, which is obviously a more modern coin because, you know, he's a newer character, superhero. And those are very, very popular, especially among kids. I find that if you're ever struggling to get like your kids excited about coins, show them some hobo nickels because a lot of times you'll be able to find ones that are Disney characters, Marvel characters, and that gets them really excited because then like their favorite superhero or their favorite character is on a coin, which they think is really, really cool. And as you can see, my um, Iron Man coin was actually carved on a Jefferson nickel. That's why it's facing the different way. It has the different legend. So not only do we modernize designs, but we use different coins. We use more modern coins as well. A lot of what I carve is still done on Buffalo nickels, but I've done dimes. I've done Jefferson nickels. I've done quarters. I've even done an elongated scent one time, which was really hard. <laughs> So we do a lot of different things. You'll see a lot of modern carvers do skulls on like Morgan dollars or Ike dollars. I don't really like doing the big coins. I like sticking with the traditional uh, buffalo nickel though. So why were they carved? There were three main reasons that these coins were being carved back during the Great Depression. You know, why they kind of came to be. And that would be to make a profit, to pass time, and to record memories. Now, when I say to make a profit, I don't necessarily mean a monetary profit of, well, this was worth five cents and now I can sell it for a dollar or whatever. I more mean they were able to trade these. They were kind of like a token that they were able to trade for food or maybe a place to sleep for the night, possibly a change of clothes. I know that there were some cases where they were able, even able to bribe uh, train conductors to let them kind of hop a ride so they could travel to a different area to look for work there. So it ended up being very profitable for them, not necessarily money-wise though. They were just able to trade these for different necessities that they might need. And it was also a way to pass time. As I mentioned, these were carved by people who were out of work, who, you know, didn't have anything to do with their day, 
they had already tried to find work. They probably were already, you know, waiting in line at the soup kitchen and probably got their meal for the day and just kind of didn't have anything left to do. They were probably waiting around at the hobo camp, kind of bored, not quite sure what to do with the rest of their day. And they'd be like, well, I have this, you know, this Buffalo nickel. Why don't I do some art? Why don't I change the design? Which could then, as I mentioned, be turned into a profit for them later on. So it was a way to be productive that could then turn into something profitable for them. And it was also a way to record memories. I think that this was less common, if I'm remembering, if I'm remembering correctly, this was a less common reason that these were carved, but you would have cases where you know, you had a guy who met a special lady, but he had to travel to a different state or a different area to find work. And so he would carve her this to remember him by, or he would carve her likeness onto a coin. You'll see a lot of uh, these turned into women. You know, that was often the case for that as well. So how did they used to be carved? I'm sure a lot of you are sitting here probably going, well, that sounds really cool, but how on earth did you change the design of a coin back during the Great Depression? And that's a great question. <laughs> so that would be done with a hammer and a nail. And I've said this and people often don't believe me. They're like, you've got to be kidding me, but it's how they were done. They would take, they would put the coin down on a stump or a rock or the ground or whatever they were using as their table. And they'd take their nail, take their hammer and just hammer away hammer that design in there, which is crazy to me. I've done hand carving before. I typically stick with my power tools though, because it's really, really difficult. And it it takes some getting used to, and it takes a certain amount of skill too, because you have to make sure you're applying the right amount of pressure and it's going the right direction and it's doing what you want it to do. And so, but that's, that's all that they had. So that's what they would use to change the design of this coin, which is just crazy to me. They could also use pocket knives. This would give them a little bit finer of a line. It would allow them to scratch in some, maybe some finer detail, or if they wanted to add some texture or some color to the coin, they could use a pocket knife. It would just give them a different tip. So if you imagine, you know, the end of a nail, especially if it was getting a little blunt, is a little bit thick. And if you were using like a pocket knife, it would give you a much finer line. It would be much thinner. And, you know, it would allow you to get that detail or that texturing in really anything sharp that they could find around the hobo camps or wherever they were working could work. As long as it was able to get their design onto the coin, who cares how it got there, right? And then they would also use tobacco containers. Now, they would use this to tone the coin. So as you can see on my coin I have here, my hat, uh, ribbon and my shirt are both black. Obviously, we know the coin is not black and we know that, you know, even if I carved deep enough, it wouldn't be black. There's not a black metal involved. That color is coming from elsewhere. So today we use things like ink, but back then they obviously didn't, you know, weren't using ink. They would use tobacco containers, what they had access to. So they put the coin They'd use something and rough up a surface so that it had some texture, so that there was something for this to hold on to. And they'd toss it in a tobacco container and it would tone the coin. So it would give the whole coin a nice tone, but it would also make these textured areas a lot darker, giving them the different colors for their design to help different aspects and areas stand out more than others. Now, today, obviously, we don't really use a hammer and nails anymore. We've kind of modernized the equipment. Uh, we've made our lives a little bit easier. So we use things like push gravers and air gravers. I will discuss those in a little bit more detail in just a moment. But those are, the air graver is basically the power tool equivalent of a hammer and nails. Um, and we also use sanding stones. So a lot of times if we're taking away part of the design, it might end up being a little bit rough. It, especially for me, I know personally, I find it challenging to get a really nice smooth surface as I'm carving away different um, aspects of the coin. If I'm carving away the feathers or if I'm carving away 
the braid, I, I find it difficult sometimes to keep it nice and smooth area, but that's where the sanding stones come in. And sanding stones are basically just <laughs> sandpaper in a stick form. They come in different grits, they come in different widths, um, and you just use them and they just kind of sand down different parts of your coin. If you, they can help you if you make a mistake, sometimes you can sand over it and it'll kind of disappear, so to say, so to speak. Uh, but it's, it's pretty much just sandpaper in the stick that you're helping kind of sand down the parts of the coin that you want to. And we also use microscopes. These are not required by any means. These are not required for carving. Plenty of people carve without them. I carve without them if I don't feel like taking it to a show or if I don't, you know, if I'm doing something with not a lot of fine detail. Obviously, they didn't use these back during the Great Depression when they were first carving hobo nickels. You know, obviously, they didn't have this technology. And so, but a lot of carvers nowadays use a microscope to get that fine detail. A lot of our coins have much finer detail than any of those classic or traditional hobos that you'll find. And that's because we have the ability to get into tighter spaces and to see the tighter spaces. So for example, this coin that I have on the screen, you can see I enhanced the hair on this Indian, right? Obviously, all those lines were not there before. That was not part of the design, just the overall shape of the braid was the design already on the coin. But I wanted to add, you know, more, more in detailed hair. So that's what I did. Now, all these lines are very, very close. It's a very, very fine detail. If I hadn't been using a microscope, I'd still have, you know, small lines of hair. There just would not be as many there and they wouldn't be as close together because I wouldn't be able to see just how much space I had between each line to make sure I wasn't carving into the other line or to make sure that, you know, my lines were all the same width or the same depth. But because I was using a microscope, I was able to really look in and see just how much space was between all of my individual lines, which allowed me to get a much finer detail. So I use it when I'm doing hair or when I'm adding detail to hats. If I'm carving off specific areas to help me see just how big of a depth difference I have going on, that's when I'm gonna use my microscope. And I use it for all my other lines as well, but it's mainly for my detail. Like I said, modern day carvers are kind of spoiled. We kind of spoiled ourselves a bit with all this modern technology to help us get, you know, these much finer details. But if you look at a lot of modern designs, <clears throat> not necessarily the ones that I do, but ones who that were carved by, you know, professional engravers and people who do this professionally for a living, their, their coins are like packed full of detail. It's insane. And you sit there and you, wonder how on earth they got all of that detail into this tiny space and it's because they had the help of a microscope <laughs> so we use those to help us get finer detail and to make the coins look a little bit nicer and then as i mentioned before with the tobacco toning we use ink to get our different colors so i know different carvers who use different types of ink. I know people who, when they finish their coin, they just draw over it with a marker and then clean off the marker and wherever the marker stuck, that's where the black is. I know people who use uh, like printer's ink, things like that. I use a very weird combination of graphite and chapstick melted together. It sounds super weird, but it really does the trick and it stains less, I have found, which is great. It's a weird mixture my mentor came up with and used, so he passed it down to me and I was like, yes, this is awesome. This works great because I was always like, I would always have black fingers when I would use ink and that didn't always go over well when you like went out in public and your hands were black. So I appreciate the one that doesn't really stay in my fingers. So this is what we call a push graver. As you can see, there's no mechanical quality to it. It's not hooked up to any machines or anything. So it's, you do all the work for you. It's a manual tool. Um, it's just basically this wooden part attached to the steel part. Now the steel end can be sharpened in two different tips. So this one is a flat graver. So it's gonna carve away nice, 
smooth sections of your coin. It's when it does it, it's going to end up looking like metal shavings. You'll get very nice, smooth, long metal shavings. When you use this tool, it's going to be wider than, let's say, a V graver or something like that. And, you know, it does the work. It, it's basically like your nail. Um, you just don't have the hammer that you're chiseling on. There are lots of modern day carvers who will carve just with this. They don't use any mechanical tools or anything. They use just push gravers and hammer and chisel. Again, I have done that and I, it does not work for me. It's very challenging and I have just great respect for all the carvers who sit there and carve entire coins with nothing but this because it's very hard there's nothing helping push it along it's just you and so you always got to make sure your tools are nice and sharp and you've got the right tips on there i personally use this when i am trying to get a nice smooth surface i find it really hard to get a smooth finish or a smooth surface with my power tools because Oftentimes I will accidentally have it going too hard or I have too much power going to it and it's hitting too fast. And so it doesn't leave an even surface. It doesn't leave a smooth finish for you to work with. And I'm like taking layer after layer after layer off and it's just, it's still uneven. So I have this like weird splotchy square background, which it doesn't work. It doesn't look good. It doesn't leave you a smooth surface to work with. But when I use this, I'm able to just take off bit by bit by bit. And, you know, it's slow and steady and you just layer by layer by layer. But you eventually get there and it ends up being a much better pro um, product, at least for me, for taking off those layers. Most carvers, however, will use this. Now this is called an air graver and it's basically a mini um, air powered jackhammer. It's fantastic, I love it. It comes in two forms. You can either have one controlled by a foot pedal or a palm control. I personally prefer the foot pedal powered one. I think it's easier to control with my foot instead of having to squeeze it. The palm control, you just have to kind of squeeze to determine how much, uh, how much power is going through, how hard your tool is hitting, how fast it's gonna carve away your metal. So, like I said, air powered jackhammer. So this section, this big metal section is basically what my hammer is, right? That's my modern day hammer, just like they would have, you know, sit and hammer away. This is my modern day hammer. The steel part on the end, that's gonna be my nail. That is what we call a graver. Now these are interchangeable and most carvers have a huge variety of these. So I have lots of them in three different tips. So the one currently on my machine, I believe is a flat graver, which is similar to what I just showed you in the other one. So it's got that flat tip, takes away long metal pieces, does those nice shavings for you. A V graver is going to make a cut a little bit more like this. It's going to give you those fine lines. It's a deeper cut and it it's usually used for line work and things like that. And then I also have what is called a stippling tool or a stippling tip, I should say. And that's it's just literally a point and I hold my tool up and down and I just kind of poke my coin essentially i poke my tool and it creates different craters but all three of those different tips are going to create a different look on my coin so like i said one creates a crater one's going to create a line and one's going to create this like long flat shiny surface for you so it depends on your design which one you're going to use and you sharpen them to different widths so i have like four different flat gravers right and there i have a wide one a slightly smaller one another slightly smaller slightly smaller one and then another small one and that is what we use to carve so essentially when i'm carving a coin what i will do is i'll sit down and i'll put my coin in a ball vise and I draw out my design. I draw my overall design so I kind of have an idea of what I'm going for. 
And then I will take my flat graver and I will carve away any part of the Indian that I don't want in there, right? So if I'm doing a traditional or classic hobo nickel, I'm going to carve off the feathers. I'm going to carve off the braid. I'm gonna carve off that fluff of the top of the hair and just basically leave the face and the neck there for me to work with. Then I'm gonna carve the basics of my design, right? So I'm gonna carve the outline of my ear, the outline of my hat. I'm gonna carve my shirt and my collar. Then I'm gonna step back and I'm gonna be like, okay, well, where am I adding detail? Most times I will add a hat ribbon or a hat band and you know, I might add a flower or a feather or maybe some shading to my hat. It depends, again, on the look I'm going for. Then I'm going to add a beard or a mustache if I'm adding those. I do typically add a beard to most of my coins. Then I'm going to add detail to my shirt. So do I want a striped shirt? If I do, I'm going to carve those stripes on there. Do I want it to be a black t-shirt? If I do, I'm going to take my stippling tool and create all those craters because those are what's going to hold my ink because it has the texture. And once I finish that, all that's left to do is to sign the coin. You know, you add your initials and then I add my ink or my graphite mixture over it and that's going to darken all of the areas that have the texture or were cut into and that's how i change the design that's how i create the hobo nickel so it's it's super basic it sounds very complicated when you start talking about oh i changed the design on a coin but it's really not uh, super, super complicated. It's not a very complex process. Once you get the hang of it, it's pretty easy. And like I said, we've kind of spoiled ourselves as modern day carvers, and a lot of our tools do the work for us. A lot of our equipment is going to do that manual labor part for us, and we pretty much just have to come up with the design and guide all of our tools. These are obviously not all of the tools that we use. You know, we every carver does things differently. And I feel like I'm constantly buying new tools after I talk to other carvers because they're like, well, if you use this, you can get a smoother finish or things like that. So I have an entire workbench um, in my work area that's just completely full of tools. I take it with me whenever I go to shows. It's very heavy, uh, but these are the main ones. These are the ones that you, are pretty common among all hobo nickel carvers, um, especially today. Like I said, not all of, all modern carvers use powerized equipment. Most of us do though. It just, it makes our job a lot easier. Now, as I mentioned, I travel around to a lot of shows um, and I set up and I carve. So I set up all my equipment, you know, I sit there with my microscope and my big thing and I carve at these shows and I sell my work and people will come up and they'll be like, so what is this that you're doing? And you start talking about it, right? I start, I go, well, I'm carving hobo nickels. It's this art form where I take the coin and I change the design. And as soon as I say that, without fail, everyone who has never heard of this goes, but isn't that illegal? Without fail, guys. This is the number one question that I get asked when I talk about hobo nickel carving. Whether they're numismatists or not, I get asked this question by literally everyone. They, everyone thinks that it's an illegal art form. Now, obviously I want to stand there and be like, well, obviously it's not illegal because I'm sitting here doing it, right? So I'm not looking to get arrested. I wouldn't be doing it out in public if <laughs> this wasn't illegal, if this was illegal, but um, I do typically give them a nicer answer than that. Um, so Title 18, Chapter 17 of the U.S. Code states that whoever fraudulently alters, defaces, mutilates, impairs, diminishes, falsifies, scales, or lightens any of the coins coined at the mints of the United States shall be fined under this title. Now, I'm sure you're looking at this and you're like, well, um, that's exactly what you do, isn't it? And you're probably thinking, so this is totally 100% an illegal art form, an illegal craft cool <laughs> but the key word we're looking at here is fraudulently now hobo nickel carvers are not doing this for fraud <laughs> this is all for artistic purpose we are not sitting there trying to tell you oh my gosh look at this super cool coin it has iron man on it and it came out of the mint looking like that this is the newest design from the mint 
I'm, I'm not trying to sell my coins that way, right? Other people aren't trying to be like, well, yeah, it has Mickey Mouse on it. This is how I came out of the mint. This is, this is how I found it, right? <laughs> it's this really rare variety. None of us are trying to do that. As a matter of fact, if you ever go to a coin show, like it's very clear that we're not being secretive about what we're doing. We're being, we're always very honest about where the coin came from, where the design came from, that we are doing it. We are creating a new piece of art and we are selling it as our art. We're not selling it as this property of the US Mint. We are selling it as, hey, I took this cool coin and I made it cooler by changing the design and putting my artwork on it, right? It's our art form. There's nothing wrong with that because we're not trying to hide that from you. I guarantee you, if you have ever been to a show where you, home and nickel carvers are set up, you know exactly what they're doing because our equipment is really loud. We have air compressors that turn on all the time and make this really loud noise. And it typically annoys all the other dealers around us because it's turning on like every hour to you know, recompress the air. So it's very loud. Our tools are also very loud because they're, they're, they're mini jackhammers, right? They're making all this noise, especially if you get like to, if sometimes they'll get stuck at a point in the coin if you're not doing it correctly. It makes a ton of noise. And we're doing it right there in front of you, right? <laughs> so most of us are very loud people too. And we like to talk to you about what we're doing. A lot of times we have just spent anywhere between one to, you know, however many hours. Mine are usually between one to four hours on the coin that you are looking at buying. So I'm going to sit there and tell you all about the process I use to create that coin because I just spent hours on it and I want you I want you to appreciate that, right? So I would sit there and I'd be like, yes, well, I carved this while I was sitting here yesterday <laughs> and it took me this long because I kept talk stopping to talk to people, right? Because I never get any coins actually carved to coin shows because I'm always talking to people about hobo nickels. But <laughs> We're, we're not trying to hide what it is we're doing. We're not trying to tell you, you are getting a coin that came right from the mint and this is, you know, this super rare variety because that's, it's not what it is. And it's super obvious that it's not what it is, but I mean, some people get confused, but we're selling you a piece of our art, right? We've, it's just our medium. It's just what we use to create our art. The coin is our canvas. And we sell it as that, you know, we always, we're always, always selling it to you as a piece of our artwork. We're constantly, everyone will tell you, they'll be like, yep, I carved this, this is my art. And we're not trying to deceive you in any way, shape or form. We don't change the date, the mint mark, the denomination, um, et cetera, anything like that. So. As numismatists, you guys know, things like that can be important. You know, the date can be really important, especially if you're looking at different varieties or rarities. Um, mint mark, also super important. Legends can be important. It just kind of depends on the type of coin that you're using, obviously. But we're not sitting there as artists. We're not sitting there. We don't sit down a coin and go, okay, well, I've got this perfectly good buffalo nickel. How can I change it and make it more valuable? And then we don't go, mm, you know, I could change this into a little bit rarer of a date. Let me just turn that into an eight right there. We're, we're not doing that, or at least I'm not doing that. I can tell you that. You know, we're not doing that. We're not trying to add mint marks. We're not trying to change. We're not trying to change the denomination. I mean, that would be really hard to do, but we're not trying to do that. Most times when you see hobo nickels, especially if you're looking at classic examples or traditional styles, we leave the date and the legend intact. So as you can see on the coin I have on the screen, I did not touch the date. The date is in the middle of my shirt. It's in the middle of my design. Yeah, I didn't touch it. When I do Indian headdresses that come all the way down the back of this coin, I don't touch the date. It goes around the date. I try not to touch the legends. Sometimes it happens, it depends on your design or it depends on how you're getting rid of stuff on the coin, but I, most of the time I'm not doing it on purpose. And when other people get rid of them, they're again, not doing it fraudulently. They're just doing it to help enhance their personal design because this is our artwork. 
we're creating something completely new. It's no longer just a classic buffalo nickel. We're making it something way cooler. At least in my opinion, we're making it something way cooler. And we're not creating super rares, right? So I'm sure as fellow numismatists, you all know about the three-legged buffalo nickel, right? Well, I do gotta say, it would be pretty easy for me to just turn my coin around and just shave off a leg. Oops, right? And go around and unseasoned numismatists or people who aren't super familiar with the variety or the, um, you know, different eras and things, they wouldn't know the difference, right? Obviously, those of you who know what you're looking for when you're looking for the three-legged variety, you're going to know, okay, well, it doesn't have those little dots. It doesn't have those little marks that there was supposed to be a leg there, right? You'll be like, mm, no, this was altered. This is not what it's supposed to be. But unseasoned numismatists or people who are just kind of getting involved, who are new to varieties, who don't understand how coins are made, aren't going to notice that. They're not going to notice a little shame. So obviously, yes, that would be super easy to do, but that would be illegal. But again, I am not doing any of that. We, us carvers, we're not doing that. That is not the purpose of our art form. We don't want you to think you're getting something that you're not. We want you to understand that you are taking home a piece of our art with you. It's something that we created. We took something cool because, yeah, buffalo nickels are super cool, but we turned it into something even cooler. Yeah, it's still a coin. You could technically still spend it. Um, it, it would technically still be legal currency. Most people don't. I know people who do. We'll put buffalo, you know, we put hobo nickels into circulation occasionally. Or we'll drop them in tip jars and some people will spend them. Some people will keep them. It gets the interest up, it gets people excited because then they go on Google and they're like, what, my my nickel looks really weird. <laughs> it's, it's got a different face on it. And, you know, learn something new. But most people aren't doing that. When most people buy a homo nickel, they're buying it for the art on the coin. They're buying it for the artists behind it. You know, I know people who have been buying coins for me since I started. And we're at the point that they're not buying it for the art on the coin. They're buying it to support me and things like that. But we're never trying to tell you you're getting something that you're not. And like I said, we like to talk about our art form. We like to talk about our work and we are very loud, especially when we're at shows. So it would be hard to hide what we were doing anyway. So it would be really hard to be fraudulent with this um, in person anyway. So yeah, they, it's a perfectly legal art form, totally legal to do. Yes, we are technically defacing U.S. money, but we're not trying to pass it off as U.S. money after that point. At, at that point, we have said, nope, it's no longer U.S. money. Now it's my work. <laughs> it's something that I've created. Enjoy that. So that is my presentation, like I said, it's just a very general overview. I could definitely go into more detail on a couple of these topics, but it's just to give you guys a brief introduction to the art of hobo nickel carving, because lots of people have never heard of it. All right. Thank you, Abby. That was wonderful. Uh, looks like we have two questions so far. Okay. Um, how do you compare prices and how do you determine the value? So that is... It, it kind of depends. So with traditional hobos, so ones that were carved, you know, back during the Great Depression, there are typical price guides for it. It depends on kind of who the artist is. There's some that go for more, you know, more well-known carvers like Bo and Bert, kind of the first hobo nickel carvers. Their coins are going to go for a little bit more, but a lot of times it's based on the design. Modern day artists, a lot of us price our coins based off of the amount of work we've put into it. So I know like for me personally, every hour I put into a coin, I add, you know, you know, $10 to the price or whatever. But it 
it's also based off of what they think their work is worth. So I am nowhere near, my coins are nowhere near as expensive as other carvers because they're like professional engravers. And I'm just, you know, a little homo knuckle carver over here. So it just kind of depends on the design, how much time was put into it, the skill level of who was doing it and how old the coin is. Okay, perfect. Um, there was one about a, a specific coin, but I'm not sure which one. So we'll go ahead and skip that one. Okay. Have you ever been paid a for a hobo nickel? And I think you answered that. But we'll... Yes. Yeah, I do. I sell my work. Um, I go to coin shows uh, around Central Florida. I'm always at the fun shows. I've been trying to get to more a a shows recently, but I don't usually set up and carve at those because it's hard to travel with all of my equipment because as I mentioned, it takes up a lot of space and is really heavy and you can't fly with it. So I'd have to like drive to these places. Mm -hmm. But um, I do a lot of local shows here in Florida and I set up and sell at shows there and at uh, coin clubs as well. Um, where can you buy the carving tools? Okay, so a lot of them, it depends on what exactly you're looking for. So the air graver is sold specifically. It's created um by Steve Lindsay. And so on his website, like Lindsay Engraving, I think it is, you can buy the tools because he makes those, he was he designed them. Those are his work. So that's where you get the air gravers. A lot of people make their tools. So um, a lot of push gravers are handmade. Steel, you can get like steel tips at like hardware stores and things like that and then sharpen them down. So I sharpen mine on just like sanding stones. So bigger versions of the sanding stones that I use for smoothing down my coins. Um, a lot of my equipment I got at like Harbor Freight or off of Amazon, things like that. It just kind of depends on what exactly you're looking for, but most of it you can find at hardware stores, Amazon. It's just those air gravers that are specific. Okay. And last one, I think this one's a little obvious, but I'll Alaska. Do you like Iron Man? <laughs> I do. In case it wasn't obvious, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit of a Marvel fan. Yeah. Um, my personal favorite, though, I have a Spider-Man coin that I carved. It was the first superhero that I did. And I wear it on a pendant around my neck and, and whenever I'm at shows. And that is the coin that gets kids like the most excited. I'll get them like mm -hmm. eyeing what I'm doing. And they'll be like, oh, she's like, changing the design that's cool she's yeah. like cutting up a coin and they think it's cool and then I'm like hey come over here because they'll be like wearing a superhero shirt and mm. I'll show them my spider-man and their eyes just like completely light up they're like <laughs> oh my gosh my superhero's on her coin yeah this was actually the first coin I ever bought so I think yes, the same page. <laughs> yes I think I have that one <laughs> yeah. yes uh, right. I no, I'm a big more. superhero fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have it's everywhere on my desk behind the camera. Yes, so. as you can see, my room. Yeah, big superhero fan. Okay, last one. Uh, how do you know if you have a depression hobo or a modern one? Okay, so that's actually a topic I am not super familiar with when it comes to hobo nickels. I am definitely more of a modern artist, and I'm more familiar with modern work. But if you go to the original Hobo Nickel Society's website, uh, it should be ohns.com, they have information on that there. And as experts, you can contact. I know there's certain things to look for, but I am definitely not an expert in that field. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you again, Abby, so much for this. That was thank a wonderful you. presentation. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and thank you to, again to Gray Sheet for making our e-learning possible. And we will see you guys on the next one. Have a good weekend, Abby. Bye.